Welcome, Dr. Praveen Kaur. Uh, thank you, Chairpersons and uh, your friends. Good morning to all of you. And uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, organizers for giving me opportunity to talk about severe acute malnutrition. And as Sir has highlighted, uh, there is really, uh, we do not have a clarity regarding the management. It's evolving, but maybe uh, in after a few months, we will have uh, some clarity on this because the ministry is preparing operational guidelines regarding these NRCs and management of severe mal acute malnutrition cases. Uh, if we see really uh, severe acute malnutrition is the largest common denominator in global child health in uh, this malnutrition is contributing maximum deaths and this malnutrition is not contributing directly but also indirectly because we uh, uh, 60 point uh, approximately 60 percent of diarrheal deaths they are contributed by underlying malnutrition and also the other condition you can see almost 50 percent of deaths are contributed by malnutrition. If we take uh, Indian scenario, uh, it's really uh, very severe, uh, our 48 percent population, if we take National Family Health Survey data, 48 percent of children are stunted, 43 percent are underweight and 16 percent they are severe underweight, 23 percent are wasted. So how to identify the child with acute malnutrition? Also, there are some recent changes. And if we have to identify uh, these, we have to take uh, basic anthropometric measurements. They help. Uh, and weight and height that we have to take. Uh, there is WHO uh, reference card. And uh, for a particular length with a chart we can identify the cases with severe acute malnutrition if this is below minus 3 standard deviation. Also uh, recently for community identifying severely acute malnourished children where we do not have facility of taking length, uh, we can use medium circumference which is being used for identification of these children. And uh, then is the clinical examination. Uh, we are looking for severe wasting and bilateral pedal edema. Based on this, uh, we can identify severe acute malnutrition if there is weight for height less than minus 3 standard deviation or if the child has visible severe wasting or midarm circumference of 11.5 centimeter. Initially, this was 11 centimeter, but in April 2009, WHO UNICEF this, they have changed this to 11.5 centimeter. And if the child has bilateral pedal edema without any other cause. If the child has weight for height uh, between minus 2 to minus 3 standard deviation or the mid-arm circumference is 11.5 centimeter to 12.5 uh, 12 centimeter and there is no edema and no severe wasting, then this child is graded as moderate malnutrition. Uh, then uh, regarding when uh, the child should be uh, admitted in facility and when uh, the child should be sent to community for management, uh, this is from our, uh, this training package on facility based management of severe acute malnutrition. Uh, if the child qualifies as case definition for severe acute malnutrition, if he has some medical complication or poor appetite, or bilateral pedal edema, then this child should go to facility. If there is no medical complication, the child has good appetite and there is no edema, then this child may be managed in community home-based management, provided they have some uh, community-based support in the community. Then coming to why these severely malnourished children, uh, they need different type of management. You will have to understand the physiological changes in severe ma acute malnutrition. Uh, when the intake is insufficient, then uh, these children, they usually conserve energy by re reducing their physical activity. They also reduce their basal metabolism by slowing uh, protein turnover. They reduce their functional reserve to the organs and their sodium potassium pump is also slow. They also have reduced inflammatory and immune responses. 
the liver is less able to make glucose and so these children are at risk of hypoglycemia and hypothermia uh, they have uh, their kidney is also less able to excrete fluids and sodium so they have risk of fluid overload their heart uh, is a smaller weaker and they are risk uh, they have risk of cardiac failure their gut also have less gastric acid they have less enzymes and so they have limited digestion and absorption they also have sodium leak into cells and so they have excess body sodium the uh, there is potassium leak out of the cells so there is all these uh, adaptation this leads to electrolyte imbalance anorexia fluid retention are uh, they are likely to develop heart failure they also have loss of muscles so they have loss of potassium magnesium zinc copper and the red cell mass is reduced so they have free iron stored in the body because of all these these children are at risk of hypoglycemia hypothermia fluid overload cardiac failure and they also have underlying infection most of time which we we won't be able to notice unless we have a strong suspicion for uh, children who have medical complication or who are admitted to facility who has given this 10 steps of routine care where we have stages of stabilization then we have transitional phase and then rehabilitation phase the few of the steps which is directly related to nutritional management and uh, is uh, related to uh, all of you the first step is treatment and prevention of hypoglycemia and uh, since these children are at risk of hypoglycemia so all the children uh, we have to check for hypoglycemia and all these children should be given 50 ml of 10% glucose or sucrose if they are unconscious and they are uh, asymptomatic and to prevent this hypoglycemia then we have to give a small treatment to hourly feeds they also have electrolyte imbalance and they have excess of sodium low potassium and magnesium and so these children need potassium supplement uh, and magnesium supplement which should be given at least for 2 weeks uh, whatever the food preparation they are uh, taking this should be uh, low in sodium and we have to supplement with electrolytes they also have micronutrient deficiency and all the all these children should be supplemented with vitamin a which should be repeated if they have uh, vitamin a deficiency signs and this should be given in uh, as oral preparation unless this child has some severe anorexia or they have edematous malnutrition they also need folic acid zinc copper multivitamin and when there is no diarrhea and when they have they are going in rehabilitation phase then we have to supplement with iron which should be given 3 mg per kg per day <coughs> coming to feeding uh, these children are given a special type of diet which is known as starter diet which is also known as f75 diet and then uh, in rehabilitative uh, after transitional phase we give them catch up diet most most of the children uh, will be you will be able to manage uh, orally nasogastric feeding will be required if the child's intake is less than 80% and once the child is able to take more than 80% of the feed then we can take out this nasogastric feed uh, nasogastric tube and we can just again shift back to oral feeds it's also important to measure the daily dietary intake and we start with 2 hourly feed and then we gradually go to 3 hourly and then 4 hourly feeds since the children are having high uh, free iron so uh, and this iron promotes bacterial growth and can make some infections worse so this is iron supplementation is not advised during the first week uh in other countries we have commercial preparation of f75 and f100 which is available at present it's not uh, available in india and what we see uh, these commercial preparation they also have sodium magnesium zinc copper 
but if it is not available then we have some other alternative and uh, uh, indian academy of pediatrics also endorses these preparations wherever we do not have uh, since it's not available in india so this f75 recipe this may be prepared with fresh cow's milk with the addition of sugar and vegetable oil but then uh, since it's not having